Before we begin, I want to say that I do not have particularly strong opinions one way or the other about the video game subgenre known as walking simulators, at least not in general. I have strong opinions about some of the games that I've played within this subgenre, but I wouldn't say that I either like or that I dislike walking simulators as a genre. Some work well and are good games. Others are not very engaging or feel lazy and didn't particularly work for me. For example, I did not like Dear Esther or Ether 1. I was immensely disappointed in Amnesia, A Machine for Pigs after having thoroughly enjoyed The Dark Descent. But on the other side of the coin, I adored games like A Gone Home, Firewatch, and What Remains of Edith Finch. So, what exactly is a walking simulator, for those who don't know? Well, like with most things in pop culture and in video games in general, the definition will vary dramatically depending on who you ask. But I think most people would agree that a walking simulator can be accurately described as an interactive entertainment that conveys a narrative almost exclusively through the exploration of an environment and the clues provided therein. You may notice that I use the term interactive entertainment as opposed to video game. I did this in order to keep this discussion's definition as non-contentious as possible. One of the criticisms of walking simulators as a genre that I specifically wish to address is the idea that they are not, in fact, video games, and such critics would immediately object to the use of the term video game in the definition. These experiences generally lack any of the violent conflict that is present in most video games, and the mechanics rarely go beyond navigating obstacles, solving simple puzzles, or managing a limited inventory. Now, while I am perfectly content to call walking simulators video games, there are somewhat valid arguments for why the label might not be appropriate for such entertainment products. It could be argued, and has been argued, that they are not video games because they lack conflict. They lack a traditional win state. They lack fail states, or any stakes at all. And they lack mechanical depth or complex systems. I personally do not accept these arguments as necessarily disqualifying walking simulators from consideration as video games. There are plenty of universally accepted video games that also lack one, more, or even all of those criteria. Pure puzzle games generally lack traditional conflict, unless you consider yourself to be in conflict with the puzzle itself. Is Tetris not a video game because it lacks an antagonist and enemies to defeat? Many simulation and management games lack a traditional win state. Are games like The Sims or City Builders such as SimCity or City Skylines not video games because you can't formally win them? What about visual novels, social simulators, and dating sims? Are they not video games because they lack complicated mechanics or system mastery? More broadly, a critic of walking sims might say that they lack challenge. But what exactly is challenge? Does it mean that the game must be physically challenging, requiring complex series of inputs that are difficult to enter in the correct sequences and within a given time window? What about games that are built around mental challenges, which might have relatively simple control inputs, but which require careful and deliberate consideration of one's actions? Or what about a game that combines physical and strategic challenges? Like, say, for example, a sports game like Madden, which ostensibly requires careful selection of a play, and then fast reflexes on the controls to actually execute the selected play. You beat the opponent with the strategy of play selection, and then also potentially beat the opponent with the actual execution of the play, your stick skills, as the community calls it. But what if the game provides an emotional challenge? What if the game conveys a story or a message that attempts to, say, challenge one's preconceived notions on a socio-political topic, or challenges your notion of right and wrong? or challenges your willingness to put up with verbal abuse or harassment, or challenges your obedient slavery to the game itself. (laughs) 
what if the game attempts such a challenge without requiring the player to shoot at enemies with a gun or stab them with a sword or even to solve complicated puzzles or riddles? Is that any less of a challenge? Is it any less of a game? Now we're getting into the territory of the more artsy, experimental games that usually encompass walking sims, but which is not limited to walking sims. And maybe that's kind of the real objection to walking sims as a genre. Maybe people object to them because walking sims are artsy projects that often have some kind of socio-political commentary attached to them. And, you know, people don't want politics in their games, even though all creative works are inherently political. As the author George Orwell once wrote, all art is propaganda. All artistic or creative works are inherently influenced by the political ideals of its creators, and all of them project an aspect of the author's worldview, whether the author was consciously aware of it or not, and even whether the author intended it or not. Perhaps challenging one's ideals and worldview is just as valid a challenge as system mastery, and in that sense, one could argue that if you stopped playing a game because you were offended by its message or you refused to talk about or acknowledge that message, then did you fail the game's challenge? Did you lose the game? So, yeah, I have no objection to walking sims being called video games. If SimCity and Ace Attorney and Microsoft Flight Sim get to be video games, then so does Dear Esther and What Remains of Edith Finch, whether I personally like those particular games or not. So from here on out, I will be referring to even the most bare bones of Walking Sims as a game. You are free to disagree. There will be substantial spoilers for the following games from here on out. For me personally, what separates a good walking simulator from a bad walking simulator is the same criteria that I use to judge whether any game is a good game or a bad game, and that is how effectively the game uses its interactivity to convey its message or to influence or challenge the emotional response of the player. This of course is an inherently subjective assessment that will be different for any given person, so any two people are prone to disagree over whether a particular game succeeds in this regard. Nevertheless, I think that the genre of walking sim has been getting better at it over its short existence, and that the line between a walking simulator and a quote, real game, unquote, is getting blurrier and blurrier as some of the richest and most rewarding gaming experiences that I've had over the past few years have come from games that are either blatant walking sims, or which are, I guess, walking sim adjacent. But first, I guess, a brief history. Perhaps the first widely recognized and probably the most foundational walking simulator was Dear Esther, released all the way back in 2008 as a Source Engine mod for free via the Chinese Room, which was then a research project at the University of Portsmouth, funded by a grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And uh, boy, talking about 2008 as the year that an entire interactive genre formed, and then thinking about all the games in that genre that have come out since then, and how much it's changed, really makes 2008 feel simultaneously really recent, but also really long ago. Ah well. But the roots of the genre do actually go back much further. Dear Esther was itself a Half-Life 2 mod made in Valve's Source Engine. It wasn't the only or even the first time that anybody had made a mod that was nothing but a level to explore. Even people playing around with the modding tools for the original Doom made, and even in some cases distributed, content that could justifiably be considered early walking sims. Heck, even earlier point-and-click adventure games and some text adventure games could also potentially fit the label. But most of those were well before my time, so I feel neither qualified nor inclined to lecture you about them. I'll link some sources in the description if you want to read more about them. 
Anyway, the first widely recognized example of the modern concept of the walking sim was Dear Esther, which is about a man wandering an abandoned Scottish isle as he comes to terms with the sudden and accidental death of his wife some time ago. The player is tasked with following an almost completely linear sequence of paths and corridors, looking at the sometimes surreal and metaphorical environments, having letters to the protagonist's dead wife narrated to them, and occasionally stopping to read some written notes. Whether this narrative or the story that it tells works for you is going to be entirely subjective. Personally, I did not find it particularly affecting. I found it to be all very dry and matter-of-fact. It's all metaphorical imagery and rote exposition that I felt completely detached from. Dear Esther is mechanically about as bare bones as a walking simulator gets, and in my opinion, represents the worst of the genre. Just having a story told to me through narration and notes as I press a button to walk forward. It's still a game, as I mentioned in the introduction, and it still has artistic merit, but I found it dull, unengaging, and just did not care for it. But, much to my previous points, just because I didn't like Dear Esther does not mean that I should dismiss Dear Esther as a game. I'm not going to go into the specific artistic merits of Dear Esther right now. If you'd like some literary critique on the game, then I encourage you to check out a video by Pixel A Day, which is called The Poem That Was Mistaken for a Game. Link will be in the description. Needless to say, Dear Esther does have literary merit, even though I didn't particularly care for it. It's analogous to acknowledging the literary merit of a novel like Moby Dick or Bram Stoker's Dracula, even though I personally find both novels to be dry and boring. I'm not going to say that Moby Dick or Dracula aren't novels, nor will I say that they don't qualify as literature simply because I don't like them. I feel much the same about many other examples of early walking sims that I've played. The Chinese Room was then contracted out to develop the sequel to Amnesia, which was called A Machine for Pigs. It, uh, in my opinion, didn't fare much better. This is despite the fact that it is part of the one subgenre of walking sim that has actually found a certain degree of success and popular respect, and that is horror. A Machine for Pigs is, once again, a simple act of walking through corridors and rooms, picking up and reading dozens of notes and listening to phone calls from a deranged stranger. Its biggest appeal is the philosophical and moral quandaries that it poses to the player through its story about the horrors of the industrialization of warfare and the treatment of people as just cogs in the industrial machinery. But just like with Dear Esther, I felt that the story of A Machine for Pigs was simply being told to me rather than me being much of an active participant. That being said, A Machine for Pigs does iterate upon Dear Esther by adding a bit more open exploration, some light stealth gameplay, and some rudimentary puzzles, which makes the game a bit more player-driven, but eh, not necessarily any better. It's still nowhere near as compelling or atmospheric, let alone as complex, as Frictional's original Amnesia the Dark Descent, which is the foundational game in the now-popular hide-and-seek subgenre of horror. Amnesia and Silent Hill Shattered Memories, which surprisingly actually predates Amnesia's release by a whole year, were succeeded by games such as Outlast, Slender, and others before merging back with traditional survival horror in the outstanding Resident Evil 7. Some might even call The Dark Descent a walking simulator itself, or even blame it for the rise in popularity of the sub-subgenre of horror walking simulators, but that's a discussion for another time. In any case, Amnesia The Dark Descent still had all of the staples of classic survival horror. It had the open exploration, it had inventory management, and it had puzzles. It just replaced shooting the monsters with having to run away and hide from it in an attempt to make the player feel even more disempowered than the limited mobility protagonists of classics like Resident Evil and Silent Hill. In hindsight, Silent Hill Shattered Memories might even deserve the title of first horror walking sim even more than Amnesia does, considering that Shattered Memories so clearly delineates its exploration segments from its chase sequences. When it comes to horror, The line between walking sim and real game was apparently always quite fuzzy. 
If you were to talk about horror walking sims, then I guess the seminal example would probably be Bloober Team's Lairs of Fear. Much like Dear Esther, Lairs of Fear simply requires the player to walk through a series of linear hallways and rooms. The catch here is that you're walking through an uncanny, surreal, haunted house in which the geometry of the game world changes in real time. You walk into a room, a jump scare happens, then you walk out the same door into a different hallway than the one you came in. I mean, it's a neat and effective trick the first few times it happens, and I'll admit it's certainly an impressive technical accomplishment, but Bluebird repeats it ad nauseum to the point of boredom. There are a few decision points in Layers of Fear that affect the ending, but in my opinion, by the time they came up, boy was I completely unaware that I had any agency to make any decisions at all. Bluebird has taken several stabs at iterating on the ideas introduced by Layers of Fear. The direct sequel, Layers of Fear 2, is, in my opinion, just more of the same. Their direct follow-up to Layers of Fear, the dystopian cyberpunk sci-fi game Observer, I think fared a little bit better. It had a little bit more open-ended, investigative gameplay, and heck, even had like optional side quests in it. But uh, it kind of degraded into walking sim territory, like in the second half, where once again, it's just a whole lot of walking through linear corridors with just picking up the occasional note or email or whatever and having exposition given to you. Blair Witch, on the other hand, has a bit more going for it. It substitutes a creepy forest for the haunted mansion of Lairs of Fear, which helps to better sell the fear of being lost. And it adds some light puzzles, inventory management, and the social simulation of having a dog companion. Uh, not to mention the kind of, sort of, I guess, combat mechanics of shining your flashlight at enemies to make them go away. But perhaps the most interesting, and unfortunately also the most underdeveloped, idea in Blair Witch is how the game uses the Blair Witch mythos itself to toy with the sense of player agency. This game questions whether you have free will, or if by simply playing the game, you are making yourself a pawn to the Blair Witch herself. You, by playing the game, are conditioning the dog, named Bullet, through reward and punishment. The Witch then conditions, conditions the stick man through pain or comfort, and the game, and by extension the Witch again, is conditioning you, the player, through ludic success and failure, or through appeal to standard video game conventions, such that, by the end of the game, you are supposedly blindly following the witch's command. Everybody is being conditioned to act against their own self-interest, and also possibly to do active harm against others. But this never really comes through as like a solid theme of the game. It's more of just a casual insinuation made in passing, while the rest of the game focuses much more on its convoluted plot spaghetti. It's also not particularly successful at this idea because of certain other game design decisions, especially where the dog is concerned. I wrote up a whole blog post about this game's plot if you want to read about it in more detail. A link will be in the video description below. Horror walking sims have been fairly popular since their conception, with games like Amnesia, Slender Man, and the like being huge early hits on streaming platforms like Twitch, and the trend has continued through games like Outlast, Soma, and most recently games like Visage and Phasmophobia. A big part of these games' popularity is that the general populace seems to be much more accepting of considering the emotional state of being afraid as a legitimate emotion for a game to create. In fact, the interactive nature of these games is what makes them scary. But people seem to be less willing to accept other emotions, such as compassion, sympathy, love, or simple curiosity as being a valid emotion for a game to target. But when you really stop to think about it, is it really any less legitimate? When trying to get other emotions besides fear out of a player, game designers have to be much more clever about using the interactive medium to successfully tell their stories, and that is exactly what some have done as time has gone on. One of my favorite examples of such is the game Gone Home. 
Gone Home is another critical darling that is similar to Dear Esther in that the entire game is walking around an environment and being given clues regarding a family drama. Where Gone Home excels dramatically compared to Dear Esther, at least in my opinion, is how much more player-driven the process of exploring the house is. Exploration is a bit more open, with the player often having access to multiple rooms or hallways at the same time. The game does do a very good job of carefully funneling the player into certain uh, paths of critical progress, but you're still free to deviate from that path and even do some very light sequence breaking. Furthermore, you don't just walk into a room and have the next piece of narrative handed to you via a voiceover or some conspicuous note. You have to actually explore the room to discover pieces of the narrative and unlock some of the narration, which takes the form of the protagonist's inner monologue. You examine the room for notes, memos, or letters. You open drawers to find objects that inform the player about these characters. You pick up items off of shelves and rotate them around to get little bits of context about their personal meaning to these characters, and so forth. Because you are actively searching for the story, finding the next piece of story feels much more rewarding. You weren't given the story, as in Dear Esther or Machine for Pigs or Lairs of Fear. You earned the story through your own curiosity and diligent attention to detail. Gone Home goes a step further by introducing some simple progress locks and puzzles for the player to solve. This further encourages the player to examine the environment carefully because you might find the key to unlock the next room or might learn a clue or password that will solve a puzzle. Even if you aren't picking up Dad's book and reading the back cover synopsis because you are interested in the character and want to know what he was writing about, you might still pick it up because it might contain a clue to unlocking a puzzle later on down the road. You might not be rummaging through Mom's underwear drawer because you're curious how she may have tried to spice up her love life with her husband, but you might go rummaging because you think there might be a key hidden under all those undies. Or, I don't know, maybe you're just a perv. In any case, by planting the seed that this game has more traditional puzzles and progress gates, the player now has the extrinsic motivation factor of solving puzzles and unlocking progression gates, as few and far between as those things might be in this game. And that's in the event that your intrinsic curiosity about the narrative isn't enough of an incentive to engage with the environment and storytelling. Either way, you're receiving the story that the game is trying to give you, and, more importantly, you're playing the game. All this is accomplished without having to concede to the inclusion of more traditional game features. There's no enemies, no health bars, no fail states. It also probably helps that the setting of the game is a literal, tangible home full of personal possessions of the characters, rather than the more abstract, metaphorical setting of something like Dear Esther, which is just harder to associate with the events and to relate to, let alone understand. Having a more personal connection to the characters through the protagonist Kate's relationship to them also helps to get the player a bit more invested right out of the gate, and it provides much more reason and context for why you're even here to begin with. And of course, we also get to know this smaller group of characters much more intimately than in some other walking simulator games like, say, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, which definitely helps to create a connection between the player and the characters. What Remains of Edith Finch is very similar to Gone Home in a lot of respects. It is also about exploring a house to discover the history of a family, except Edith Finch is much more surreal and whimsical. It's like Gone Home by way of Tim Burton. It doesn't have the same level of interactivity that Gone Home has. There's less items to interact with and the progression is much more linear. But where Edith Finch succeeds compared to other lesser walking simulators is how it presents the notes and narration that it gives you. Instead of simply walking into a room and reading a note or having a voiceover narrate to you, Edith Finch lets you play out each note in a little gameplay vignette. Instead of reading dozens of dry notes, memos, and letters scattered around the game environments, you get to actually act out their events in a variety of whimsical ways. Whether you're soaring through the sky via the imaginative journal of a cousin's dreams, or being a baby playing with your bath toys and letting your imagination bring them to life. 
you are participating in these events. One of these vignettes is even one of the most relatable experiences that I've ever had playing a video game, which is daydreaming about playing a video game while at work. More importantly, however, is that this game also plays around with the idea of player agency, which is actually a very popular topic in walking simulators. By exploring these ideas of a family curse, every vignette that you play is a reenactment of the moments leading up to the tragic death of a member of the Finch family. You know that your actions are somehow going to lead to these characters' death, but you don't know how or when it will happen. Is it the curse that kills the members of the Finch family, or is it their own irresponsible and self-destructive actions? And how innocent or culpable are you, the player? Or maybe there is a curse, but that curse is not some mystical mumbo-jumbo or destiny or fate or whatever. Maybe the curse of the Finch family is a genetic predisposition toward mental illnesses, such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, which have been inherited by every blood member of the family, and which leads these characters to take the irresponsible and self-destructive actions that they take. In this sense, the game also poses the question of whether the player is responsible for the harmful actions that you take, or if you are off the hook, so to speak, because you're being given unreliable stimuli. You're acting based on the symptoms of mental illness that, in the context of this game, feel as real to you as anything in actual reality. And that is the sort of thing that can really only be conveyed through an interactive medium. Edith Finch probably doesn't work as a movie because the interactivity is key to communicating this message. It only works as a video game. And then of course there's other similar games like The Stanley Parable, which is entirely a deconstructive exercise in blindly following the orders that the game provides. Within just a few years of Dear Esther's release, we've already seen walking sims like Gone Home, Edith Finch, and others start to find ways to transition from passive experiences to much more active experiences. But the evolution of the genre doesn't end there. Developers have also started reintroducing some more traditional video game conventions in order to add more gameplay to their walking sims. This is the case with Firewatch. Firewatch gives you a modestly sized open environment for you to explore, and gives you only a map, a compass, and the landmarks and signposts to help you navigate that space. The space isn't super large or complicated, but if you do turn off the location indicator on the settings menu, which I highly recommend doing, then navigating the space turns into a little exploratory puzzle. It's kind of like finding the next Colossus in Shadow of the Colossi with just your little reflective sword to guide you. The implication that something sinister may be afoot is designed to make the player more curious about the environment in Firewatch. It plants the idea that if you look closely at your environment and explore off the beaten path, you might find secrets within the game world that may expose the conspiracy against you. Further, your interactions with the NPC Delilah add an element of social simulation that implies the possibility of achieving different outcomes between the two characters. Is she part of the conspiracy? Is it possible for me to catch her in a lie that exposes her involvement or complicity? Or is all of this just a delusion in the mind of a forest ranger who's gone stir-crazy due to his isolation in the great outdoors? Like with Gone Home, Firewatch gives the player the opportunity to earn the story that the game is telling by engaging with the player's curiosity in more real and tangible ways. It isn't simply taking you on a guided tour of the environment and spoon-feeding you bite-sized chunks of story as you go, and then simply hoping that the player plays along. Firewatch puts in the legwork to try to earn the buy-in of the player. Despite providing more player-driven and open exploratory experiences than games like Dear Esther or Layers of Fear, these other games like Gone Home, Firewatch, and Edith Finch are still firmly in the category of walking simulator. I don't think anybody is going to dispute that, even if you do think that they are good examples of walking sims. But what about something a little bit more out there. What about Outer Wilds? Is Outer Wilds a walking simulator? After all, Outer Wilds isn't asking the player to do all that much more than Firewatch. Both require you to use a compass and landmarks to navigate an environment with some light to moderate obstacles, adding a navigational puzzle element. 
The big difference is that Outer Wilds gives you a spaceship and a jetpack and asks you to navigate lower zero gravity environments in 3D space. It's a walking simulator in three dimensions. It's a, I don't know, space walking simulator. There's no enemies to shoot, no Metroidvania style upgrades that allow you to unlock or bypass progress gates, only the light survival mechanics of a depleting oxygen reserve. But surely that doesn't make a difference, right? I mean, would adding a depleting stamina bar to Firewatch that requires you to actually eat that protein bar that you find in the beginning of the game have made the game not a walking simulator anymore? And if it did, would it have been a better game for it? Eh, probably not. Outer Wilds does have one instance in which you have to silently sneak past some hostile wildlife, but it isn't asking any more of the player than avoiding the pig monsters in A Machine for Pigs, or avoiding the abominations in Soma. Does that slight stealth element make A Machine for Pigs, or Soma, not a walking simulator? And as a quick side note, Soma is also a very good walking sim, and also an exceptional science fiction game because of how it not only presents some heady sci-fi ideas, but also asks the player to apply those ideas and then consider the moral, ethical, and even metaphysical implications of those applications. Most other walking sims are deeply personal, contemplative experiences. Outer Wilds is a bit more metaphysical and grandiose about its introspective qualities, but it's still deeply personal. It's about our place in the universe. Even though we are, each of us, small and insignificant in the grand scope of the cosmos, we are still, each of us, important to ourselves and also to each other. Because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Outer Wilds is also a game about discovery. It's a Metroidvania in which your only upgrades are your own knowledge of the game world, or the game universe, I guess, more appropriately, and also your knowledge of how that game world works. Everything you need to beat the game is given to you right from the start of the game. If you cheat and look up a walkthrough, you can grab the launch codes and go straight to the end of the game within about 30 minutes but then you miss the 10 or so hour act of discovery, which is the whole point of the game. The only thing that stops you is that you don't know yet. If you actually do play the game as it is intended, which I highly recommend that you do because this is like one of my favorite games ever, then you'll basically just be moving from place to place, learning the story from notes placed throughout the world and solving the occasional puzzles. The whole game is piecing together the mystery of the story from the fragments that you learn through your exploration, just the same as in Dear Esther, Gone Home, Edith Finch, or any other so-called walking sim. The only difference is that Outer Wilds is more open-ended. It's an open world, open worlds, walking simulator. Outer Wilds works exceptionally well as a mystery game also, because the entire game space is one big puzzle for the player to solve using your own intuition and ever-expanding knowledge of the space and how it works. But talking about how The Outer Wilds works as a mystery game is a bit out of the scope of this video. Um, but gosh, I really love Outer Wilds, and I really love talking about how great it is. So I might have to earmark this mystery game topic for a future video essay so that I have another excuse to talk about it. So on the topic of future projects, I would like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that my YouTube and blogging activities are entirely crowdfunded by viewers like you through Patreon. I sincerely thank my patrons for helping to make all this possible, and I would like to be able to continue to provide this content free of obnoxious ads. For this project in particular, I had to buy some walking sims that I didn't already own in order to play them and gather footage. I also recently had to buy a new microphone because my old headset crapped out on me. You let your kid use your headset for distance schooling just once. Ugh. Patreon funds also went a long way towards offsetting those costs, so thanks again to my patrons for your contributions. I know this pandemic has been tough on everyone for the last year and a half, and I lost a few of my patrons because of it. So I hope that if you really enjoy this content or any of the other content that I create, whether it's civilization strategy guides, indie football game critiques, game reviews, or so forth, then I hope you'll send a buck or two my way on Patreon. Patrons will enjoy previews of upcoming content, and higher tier patrons will get early access, as well as the ability to vote on polls of future content. More benefits may be added as my support base grows. 
Fans of my football content will be pleased to know that I'm finishing up my draft of the next installment of my series on How Madden Fails to Simulate Football. I plan to put up an outline of the script as an early preview for my patrons, and then a preview clip of the project itself will follow a couple of weeks after. Thanks in advance for your support. And if support through Patreon is just out of the question right now, I understand. It's been a rough and unstable financial year for all of us. But you can still support the channel by liking the video and sharing it with any of your friends who may enjoy it. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you'll see future content. And, you know, maybe even leave a comment to let me know what you think. And to provide that oh-so-valuable engagement that the YouTube algorithms seem to love so much. For practically its entire history so far, which is up through the end of 2020, the walking sim genre has been almost exclusively in the realm of indie gaming. AAA publishers and developers haven't really touched this particular subgenre, uh, with only a few small exceptions. Let me remind you that you could argue that Silent Hill Shattered Memories was actually the first modern horror walking sim, which ironically was funded by a major publisher. I guess you could maybe also say that Until Dawn could liberally be classified as a horror walking sim. Eh, I can't really think of any others off the top of my head unless you want to call the first half of Final Fantasy XIII a walking sim. <laughs> but if you want an example of the emergence of a triple A walking sim, then you should look no further than Hideo Kojima's highly experimental Death Stranding. I've already looked closely at Death Stranding in a video essay about open world gaming, but it definitely warrants a little bit more examination here. In his review on Polygon, Russ Frustick called Death Stranding the most advanced walking simulator the world has ever seen. In fact, Death Stranding probably deserves the label of walking simulator much more than any of the other games mentioned previously, since it is the only game that I've discussed and that I know of that actually attempts to systemize the very act of walking itself. While the game does include enemies and the weapons and combat mechanics to fight those enemies, the core challenge of Death Stranding is really navigating the environment. Rabid package thieves are really only one of many obstacles between you and delivering the mail that you're sworn to deliver. Rain, snow, apocalyptic ghost monsters, or shine. Finding or creating safe paths through the environment is the real gameplay challenge here. And this is where Death Stranding really does deviate the most from the more typical definition of a walking sim. It actually does include fail states. So its classification as a walking sim is debatable, even though the vast majority of the game is literally about walking across the countryside, delivering mail to people's front doors. In hindsight, I really think that Sony and Kojima Productions should have saved Death Stranding so it could be a PS5 launch title, in addition to giving the console a high-profile exclusive that is a new IP instead of just a remake of a, a game from 10 years and two console generations ago, and a pseudo-sequel to a game from two years ago. It might have also built up extra hype and excitement for Death Stranding itself. All the PlayStation fanboys would certainly have been much more zealous about defending Death Stranding from critics, or apologizing for it, depending on how you think Death Stranding turned out, because those fanboys would not only be defending the game, but also their $400 console purchase in order to play the game. Perhaps more importantly, though, is that Death Stranding had the potential to have been an excellent showcase for the PS5's novel haptic feedback feature. Feeling all of the different types of terrain under your feet, in your fingers, and having the controller itself resist your attempts to hold the triggers to balance Sam Porter as he, say, descends a steep slope, probably would have gone a long way towards making Death Stranding's hiking mechanics feel more like a genuinely innovative gaming concept, and less like the boring lack of gameplay that some people criticize the game for. It's also kind of amazing how prescient Death Stranding is now in the context of the COVID pandemic. It's amazing how the themes of social isolation, societal collapse, and working towards the public good are all relevant to our real world in the year or two after the game was released. Like, damn, Kojima is just amazing at prophesizing these sorts of things. 
regardless of whether it was ahead of its time and whether it will be more appreciated in the future, Death Stranding may have been a watershed game because it opened up the possibility for other high-profile developers to get funding from publishers to create and release bigger budget variations or iterations of the walking sim genre. That process was already starting, and once again, horror has been the earliest successful adopter of the big-budget walking sim genre. As I mentioned before, we had Silent Hill Shattered Memories, and we also had Alien Isolation and Resident Evil 7 show similar inspirations years later. Kojima's own PT demo for the cancelled Silent Hills proved that there is an appetite for avant-garde, big-budget horror walking sims. Sadly, that PT project was never fully realized, and the indie games like Visage have come along to fill the gap while we wait for a major publisher to pick up the ball and run with it. Visage itself is an interesting example because it takes many of the ideas behind earlier horror walking sims and then reintroduces some old-school survival horror concepts such as puzzles and resource management. Whether Visage qualifies as a walking sim is probably debatable. After all, it does include monsters and fail states. I was never one to argue that a walking sim isn't a video game to begin with, but each passing year, the line between a walking sim and a real game, for lack of a better term, seems to get blurrier and blurrier. It's to the point now that I'm playing some games and genuinely unironically asking myself, was that a walking sim? Seriously, is Outer Wilds a walking sim? Is Visage? Are Death Stranding and PT walking sims? Would Silent Hills have been a walking sim if it had actually been released? I honestly cannot give a definitive answer. That doesn't mean that the classic examples of walking sims have gone away. Those are still being made, especially within the low-budget indie market, where a creator can create a walking sim in order to get your ideas out there for comparatively low cost and less work compared to a more traditional game. As game development tools become easier to use and more accessible, I actually imagine that even the lowest budget of indie walking sims will offer more complex and player-driven experiences. And between PT and Death Stranding, Hideo Kojima has made a compelling case for the emergence of big-budget walking sims from major publishers. And to be clear, when I say big-budget, I don't mean every publisher making games on the scope and cost of Death Stranding. But with EA's recent success with Star Wars Squadrons, we could see major publishers greenlighting developers to create more middle-budget games that those developers want to make. This could create a great market niche for major developers for major developers to release highly polished games that are higher budget than what indie developers can afford, which is what I mean when I say big budget and which can iterate, expand, and hopefully innovate on the ideas that traditional walking sims have introduced. I feel like it's only a matter of time now before we start seeing those sorts of games, and when that happens, the line between walking sim and real game will only continue to get blurrier. <laughs> <laughs>